Okay, video for section 1.5 on parent functions and transformations. So a parent function is what a function starts out to be before it has any transformations or a shift left, right, up, down, a stretch, um, a reflection. All of those transform the parent function into other functions that we um, look at. So we're going to go through the parent functions and I'll talk about each one. So first is a constant function, and a constant function is f of x equals c, so that c can represent any value, any integer value or irrational number, it can be any number that you plug in, and it's always going to be a horizontal line. The identity function is f of x equals x, um, sometimes it's called the linear function. Then we have the quadratic function, f of x equals x squared and the cubic function f of x equals x to the third power. Next is the square root function, which is the square root of x. The reciprocal function, also called the rational function, f of x equals 1 over x. The absolute value function, which is f of x equals the absolute value of x. Most of these parent functions we've seen in Algebra 1 or Algebra 2. Um, now the next one is called the greatest integer function, and you've probably never seen it before. So this is a double bracket around x, which is called a greatest integer function. It can also be called a step function because it looks like stair steps. So what the greatest integer function is, is whatever value is inside the greatest integer, you're going to go to the number to the left of that on a number line. So whatever whole number is to the left on a number line, that's going to be the greatest integer of that number. So the greatest integer of any whole number, like negative 4, is just going to be equal to negative 4. But the greatest integer of negative 1.5, if I think about where negative 1.5 is on the number line, I would go to the left, whatever whole number I run into on the left, that's the greatest integer. So that would be negative 2. Works the same way for a fraction. The greatest integer of 1 third, I'm going to go to the left on the number line and that will equal 0. So whenever you see a greatest integer function or a step function, you're always going to see a closed circle, a line, and an open circle. Or it may even flip over and be open circle, straight line, and then a closed circle. Okay, next thing we're going to be looking at is all the different transformations that we can do to functions. So first are vertical translations. A vertical translation is when you shift the function up or down. So that's when you're going to see a, a function plus a number or a function minus a number. And when that number is positive, you're going to shift that many spaces up. When the number is negative, you're going to shift that many spaces down. For a horizontal translation, you're going to see a plus or minus number with an x, probably in parentheses somewhere in the equation. If you have a number that is plus something, or x plus a number, that's actually going to go to the left that many spaces. And then if you have an x minus a number, that's going to go to the right that many spaces. So anytime you see something in parentheses and you're going to pull it out, it's always going to be the opposite sign or opposite direction of what you would think. Okay, next are reflections across the x-axis and y-axis. So if you see a negative in front of the function, or they've multiplied a negative 1 times the entire parent function, then that's going to be a reflection across the x-axis. If you see a negative multiplied times an x, just the x in parentheses possibly, that would be a reflection across the y-axis. Okay, next are dilations. And these can be the trickiest because looking at these pictures, they both look the same. So we have to be able to look at the equation to determine what type of dilation it would be. So if you are multiplying a number times f of x, times the whole function, then when that number is greater than 1, that's an expansion vertically. So it's going to stretch up. 
When the number being multiplied is a fraction, if it's between 0 and 1, that is a vertical compression. So it's actually going to look like it squished down. Okay, so it looks like it got wider. If you have a number being multiplied times x in parentheses, or just the x, then that would be a compression horizontally if that number is greater than 1. So it's going to look like a stretch up, but it's a compression horizontally. When that number is between 0 and 1, then that's an expansion horizontally. You've stretched it out left and right. Okay, next are transformations with absolute value. Um, you've probably never seen these before. So the first one is when there's absolute value around the entire function. Everything is in those absolute value bars. Then what it's going to do is it's going to take any part of the original function that would have graphed below the y-axis, and it's going to reflect that up. If inside the function somewhere there is an absolute value, then it's going to take that entire function and it's going to take whatever is on the right hand side of the y-axis, it's in quadrant 1, and it's going to reflect that across the y-axis. Okay, so now we're going to look at three examples on graphing these functions. We're going to talk about what the parent function is, what types of transformations were made, and then we're going to graph the parent function and the new function. So on number one, our new function g of x is 3 over x. So first thing I need to think about the parent function. And you can graph it on your calculator if you want to and look at the picture and decide which parent function does this closely resemble, or you can look at the function itself. Anytime I see an x in the denominator, that reminds me that this is a reciprocal function, or sometimes called a rational function. So that rational parent function, or reciprocal parent function, is f of x equals 1 over x. So then I need to think about what did they do to this parent function to get my new function, g of x. Well, this one seems pretty easy. So it looks like they just multiplied times 3 on the top. So I could write it this way, that g of x equals 3 times 1 over x. So then that gives an indication to me of what's going on, what type of transformation was performed. So we said earlier that if you're multiplying something, that's going to be a dilation of some sort. And since it's 3 times the entire function, that's going to be a vertical dilation. So this is actually going to be a vertical expansion because that number that's being multiplied is greater than 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph these two functions on the same coordinate plane. I'm going to graph my parent function in blue and my new function in purple. So what I've done is I've put both of these functions in y equals in my calculator, and then I'm just going to go to the table and plot some points. Now, I like to plot whole numbers as much as possible. Sometimes they just don't exist. So you just kind of skip around and find several points that you can. So first up, I had negative 4, and I believe it was negative 0.25, and then negative 3, negative 1 third, and then negative 2, negative 1 half, negative 1, negative 1, and then there weren't any other values. There was an error there, so that means there's an asymptote in the middle. And then it jumped over positive 1, positive 1, positive 2, 1 half, positive 3, 1 third, and positive 4, 1 fourth, or 0.25. So I can't just go based on these points alone. What's happening with this function is it's getting, it's decreasing all the way across the function. So from left to right, it's going down on both sides. So it's going to get closer and closer to that y-axis where there would be an asymptote in this graph. Okay, so that's the parent function. So now I'm going to graph the new function, g of x. So I put 3 over x in my calculator, and I'm going to go to the table and plot some points as well. So I can't remember what this was. I think negative 4.75, negative 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1 and a half, 
negative 1, negative 3. And then it skipped a little bit at 0. There was an error there still. And we jumped over to 1, positive 3, 2, 1 and a half, 3, 1, and 4.75. So this is going to be very similar from left to right. It's going to be decreasing. So when I compare these and I think about a vertical expansion, you can see that it's kind of pulling away from that y-axis. Okay, it looks a little wider in there. Okay, so example two, same thing. We have a function that is g of x equals negative absolute value of 4x. So this one's going to be a little more tricky because just I've got several things going on here. So starting with the parent function. So I see the absolute value bars. That should be a clue that this is the absolute value function. That parent function is going to be the absolute value of x. So then I think about what did they do to get this g of x function. Well, they multiplied times a negative on the outside. So that, to me, indicates there's going to be some type of reflection happening. And this is a y-axis reflection since it's outside of those absolute value bars. If there was a negative inside the absolute value, that would be x-axis. Okay, and then also there's a 4 being multiplied times the x. It's with the x inside the absolute value bars. So that tells me that this is a horizontal dilation, and it's actually a compression because it's bigger than 1. If that 4 had been on the outside, then it would be like our last problem. It would be a vertical something. Okay, so it's just good to know those things so you can identify what's going on in the function. So I'm going to graph the parent function in green and then the new function in purple. So to get the absolute value in your calculator, there's several ways to get it. And what I like to do is after I'm in y equals, then I just hit second zero, which takes you to the catalog, which is a list of everything in the calculator. Absolute value is the first thing that's listed, ABS, open parenthesis. So, absolute value of X, when I plot that and I go to the table, here's some points that I'm going to get. So, negative 4, 4, negative 3, 3, negative 2, 2, etc. Then, on the positive side, it's going to be those same values, it's just flipped over. So, we know what the absolute value function is, it looks like a V. So same thing for g of x. When I type this in the calculator, I would type negative first, then go to absolute value by hitting second zero, then do 4x and close parenthesis. So this time when I go to the table, these are the points that I found. Negative 2, negative 8, negative 1, negative 4, 0, 0, 1, negative 4, and 2, negative 8. So we can see that when we connect the dots here, this is a y-axis reflection and then is a horizontal compression. Horizontally, they've squunched that together and so it looks skinnier. Okay, last example. This is called a piecewise function and it wasn't in the parent functions because it's just pieces of several other types of functions. So it could be any combination of different functions. And we've had a couple of examples with this. We just haven't gone over it in detail. So in your calculator, this is what you're going to type. We don't need to find the parent function or do any of that with this problem. We're just going to put this in our calculator and graph it piece at a time. So what I've done is actually written out exactly what to type in your calculator because it's very important with these piecewise functions to type them in correctly. So. For y1, I've done the absolute value of x plus 2. That's the function. And then the restriction is that x has to be less than 0. So after you type the function, you're actually going to do the divided symbol and then parenthesis x. To get the inequalities, you're going to go to second math, and you have your list of inequalities, and then 0. So same thing for y2. I'm going to start with a parenthesis, absolute value of x, minus 2, close parenthesis. Then I'm going to div divide it by, and I want x greater than or equal to 0. 
and x less than or equal to 2. You have to put those divided by symbols in there and tell it, hey, these are our restrictions. You're going to start at this spot and end at this other spot. And then the last one is going to be the parentheses of square root of x minus 2 and then plus 2, close parentheses, and that is when x is greater than 2. So if you go to your table after you've typed all of this in, you're going to see lots of crazy stuff in there because it's graphing all three of these functions simultaneously, and it's going to take out any points that it doesn't need for each six section of the graph. So you can see lots of errors in there. So let's start with y1. I'm going to graph that one in orange. So y1 is an absolute value function that is actually shifted to the left two spaces. And I know it's left two because it's a plus two in the parentheses. So we're going to graph that function all the way up to um, x is equal to zero. We're not going to equal zero, it's just up to that spot. So I'm going to find some points, then when I graph it, I'm going to create that V and I want that line to go all the way up to the Y axis and we're going to put an open circle there because everywhere up to zero, we're using this absolute value function. Now, when the value actually equals zero, that's when it's the Y2 equation, which is just absolute value of X minus two. Now, since this minus 2 is outside of the parentheses with the x, this tells me it's the absolute value function shifted down two spaces. And we're just going to graph that graph only from 0 to 2. So that's actually just a few points on here, three little points that I'm going to put and connect with a line. So really, they could have used some other function there. A linear function would have worked as well, since it's just one those three little points, basically. Okay, then y3 is a square root function. Since there's a minus 2 underneath the radical, that's going to be a shift right. And then the plus 2 outside of the radical is going to be a shift up 2. Okay, so then when I plot some points from that graph, it kind of looks like this. We're not going to start this um, square root function at that first point. It's actually going to go and connect up and line up with that second function. So if you see there, I drew an open circle and continued my square root function. So as I go from left to right across the graph, it's going to be continuous all the way. It's just going to jump. This is one of those jump discontinuity problems. But it needs to line up everywhere across the graph. 